webinar. We're going to um, take about one more, one or two more minutes just to make sure everybody uh, enters our virtual room here, and then we'll be getting started. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Michelle Savage, and I'm with Expert US. And you are here for our webinar case study, Liberty Mutual Surety Custom Expert Data Collection. Uh, we're very excited about our program, but before we get into the agenda, I just want to cover a few quick logistical points. Um, if you have any problems uh, seeing the video or hearing the audio, please email us at support at xbrl.us and we'll do our best to get you back online. Uh, we will be recording the session today, so you'll be able to see the replay of it um, in the next couple of days. And then finally, I wanted to mention that we will take questions and we'll have a question session at the end. So if you do have a question, click on the little Q&A link that you see on the screen, uh, not the chat, but the Q&A. Click on that, just key your question in, and then um, we'll queue those up for the end. So with that, let me go ahead and make introductions. Um, to start our agenda, we're going to have a discussion on the importance of automation. Uh, we have with us today, Greg Davenport. Greg is Senior Vice President, Global Risks at Liberty Mutual Surety. And he's gonna be in conversations, conversation with Campbell Pride. Campbell is the President and CEO of x US. Uh, next, we'll have Todd Chance. Todd is Commercial Surety Manager at Liberty Mutual Surety. And Todd is going to talk a little bit about how Liberty Mutual prepared and consumed financial data before standardization was put in place. So that's our, our before. Then we'll turn back to Campbell, who's going to talk about how x supports financial data automation. And then Todd is going to talk a little bit about um, the after, what happened when Liberty Mutual transitioned to data automation. Um, and finally, um, we'll turn back to Greg, who's going to cover uh, the benefits of the program for Liberty Mutual Surety and what their plans are going ahead. Then, um, then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. And we'll also be joined by Angie Starkey. Angie is also a commercial surety manager at Liberty Mutual Surety, and she's here to join us because she's been involved in this project as well. So I want to thank our speakers today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Campbell, who's going to talk a little bit about the importance of automation. Thank you, Michelle, um, and thank you for the introduction. So today we have Greg Davenport uh, with us today, and we're going to have a, a little Q&A session um, with Greg and talk about the, the benefits of automation and, and what Liberty Mutual has been up to. So um, the first question, and for Greg here is to tell us, Greg, about your role at Liberty Mutual Surety. Campbell, as Michelle mentioned, I'm a senior vice president in our global risk division. Among other things, I'm responsible for the automation supporting our commercial surety underwriters in the United States, as well as all underwriters outside of the United States. Okay, great. And to, to what extent has uh, Liberty Mutual um, and the surety industry embraced the automation of financial analysis? Well, at Liberty Mutual, we've championed the development and, and adoption of data standards for the surety industry going back over 20 years. As chair of the Surety and Fidelity Association's e-business advisory committee, and as a member of Accord's Global Standards Committee, we focused first as an industry on standardizing bond data, but when our industry was ready to move on to financial data, we turned to XBRL to ex expand the existing standards to include work and process schedules and percentage of completion accounting for contractors. Now, downloading SEC data for publicly traded companies in the US, which we'll talk about today, has always been part of our vision. Um, so I'm excited to tell the story along with uh, Todd and Angie about how we partnered at Liberty with XBR US to make this vision a reality. 
Okay, thanks, Greg. And so, so Greg, what do you believe that believe financial data automation? Um, how do you think it will be useful across the industry? Well, um, since I'm dating myself, but since becoming a surety underwriter uh, myself 40 years ago, I've seen underwriting's time be more and more consumed with data entry. It's expensive, time consuming, and it carries the potential for errors. By freeing up underwriters from data entry, they can spend more time underwriting and producing new business and their job satisfaction will be higher. All right, exactly. And so, and, and obviously part of doing that, what do you see as um, some of the biggest hurdles that the industry is like surety bonding must overcome to enable more automation? Well, um, I think one thing all industries have in common is that um, there's a struggle for competing priorities. Excuse me. And uh, uh, we have limited IT resources and budget. Uh, seeing the cost benefit of automation is a start. So showing that to justify the, the development effort. For XBRL specifically, the biggest hurdle is to transform the construction industry, to provide financial statements digitally in XBRL format. Um, the reason that's the biggest hurdle with surety is because most contractors are private companies and there's no requirement to provide financial statements in XBRL as the SEC does or has that requirement for publicly traded companies. Um, I wanna be clear though, rather than place an additional burden on contractors, we as an industry, again, facilitated by XBRL US are working with CPAs and those providing financial systems to contractors. So the systems that the contractors actually use to provide their output in XBRL format so that the sureties and even banks can consume it digitally. Uh, this has been or continue to be a slow process in contrast to the publicly traded information, but those providing contractor financial data are at the table with XBRL with our surety working group. Um, and that's very encouraging. Okay, thanks. Okay, and then then fi final question for you. So what do you think the industry can do to get behind greater automation? Well, I think taking advantage of the public data that's already available in XBRL format, Campbell, and continuing to encourage CPAs and software providers to provide an export of their data digitally, again, in XBRL format. Um, to do so then that enables faster financial analysis by sureties uh, which should result in faster responsiveness to our agents and brokers and our surety customers, of course. When financial results are good for our accounts, that also gets reflected uh, in our financial programs and can support more surety credit when needed. So I, th I think those are all direct benefits specifically to the surety industry, our agents, brokers, and our um, customers that we bond. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Greg. I think it's an excellent introduction. And today we're going to go through now and, and learn about what Liberty Mutual's done and some of the, the efforts we've done in surety. So I think the next slide we're going to hand it over. Michelle, I'll hand it back to you and you can introduce um, the first part of the, the presentation. Great. Thanks, thanks so much, Campbell and Greg. Um, we're now going to turn it over to Todd Chance. And um, Todd is one of the key analysts that's been working on this project, and he's going to tell us a little bit about uh, how Liberty uh, gathered uh, financial data and conducted analysis in the pre-XBRL era. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. A lot has changed in the recent months, so why don't we start with how we were managing the financial data, and then later I'll reflect on how we've transitioned with the help of XBRL. You know, the financial data and specifically, you know, analyzing the financial information contained in either the quarterly financial statements or year end financial statements. That's one of the key operating or key underwriting metrics that we use in order to come up with a decision if we're going to support an account or a specific risk. So the financial analysis begins with kind of taking apart the financial data. And that includes the balance sheet, the income statement, and the statement of cash flows. And here in this uh, screenshot, we've got a calculator because with the manual input we've done up until recently, you've had to have a calculator 
to calculate some of the various components of the balance sheet, income statement, and what have you. Um, so from here, the manual process starts. And if you go to the next slide. So with, with Liberty, we've got kind of a general introduction where we'll put in some of the uh, information, the statement date, what we want to what we want to look at there, consolidated statements, period of uh, in months. If it's you know, in this case, it's a year end, so twelve months, and this is kind of the um, starting point for us. Uh, then the fun really starts. So if you go to the second page here. With this, now the underwriter has the task of manually inputting the information. So here, the, the sales, the cost of sales, I've, I've actually taken a screenshot of a limited part of the income statement. And if you'll notice, there's, there's a few sales that we use, um, but expanding this is going to be a major, it will have a major impact in going forward as we, as we partner with the XBRL team. But here you can see um, certain areas will require a combination of inputs. For example, other income or other expenses. Those can involve two or three or even four different combinations of calculations. So while this form is very helpful, it's somewhat antiquated when we um, open the door and, and enter into the new landscape with the XBRL and that download capabilities. Next slide. Here I uh, illustrated kind of the balance sheet. Again, you're inputting manual inputs uh, into these different cells. We do have the ability to make adjustments as you've seen in kind of the center column. It's up to the underwriter whether he will allow, he or she will allow certain items. Sometimes they're referred to soft assets. But at the end of the day, you also have the ability to um, detail, for example, in the other non-current assets. That is somewhat of a catch-all uh, down below the prepaids. Uh, somewhat of a catch-all for, again, numerous items that might go into that uh, cell. And for us, that was a, a, a way of us to detail what all uh, the source of, you know, what contributes to, in this case, other non-current assets of 205 million. We explain that in the notes section there. Todd, thanks very much. Um, I think now we're going to turn over back to Campbell and talk a little bit about uh, how data standards can work to automate this, uh, what is today currently a, a manual process. Campbell? Okay, thanks, Michelle. So if we, we go to the um, first slide we've got here. All right, so just to give you just some, some automating, how are we gonna automate the, this public company data? And so one of, the, one of the, the processes we go through is to normalize this data. So the amount of data that's available in an XBRL filing is very voluminous. You know, there can be thousands of data elements. And, and what we wanna do is we wanna basically pull out the data that um, we wanna use for the analysis. So all of that, all of that data and that financial report that's initially filed with the, the SEC is, you know, commonly referred to as as reported data, um, and so that that can be very, very detailed, very granular, and is really at the, the level which the company wants to report to get their story across. However, if we want to do comparison across companies, we have to do a process called normalization, and, and what this means is basically making it into an apples to apples comparison between companies. So this means taking the detail detailed data that's being reported and then rolling it up into a consistent reporting framework so that we can, can use the information in a, in a reasonable way. Um, so you basically, we go through, as we go through that normalization process, we basically do what's called a mapping exercise, um, and then we can basically get the consistency. 
Um, so to facilitate that, and that's, that's exactly what Todd was showing us, they're taking all this data and, and you, you know, typically it's a very manual process to, to bring that into a system and it requires a lot of judgment. But with the XPRL data, there's a lot of detail in there which you can really help to facilitate that process and try and take a lot of the, the manual laborious um, work that's required out of the process. So the we what we we set up was a way to automatically extract the XPRL direct data directly from the SEC um, from the SEC's um, database, um, and then uh, then feed that into feed that data into create like a normalized data set, which then can then can be can be used to basically do analysis. Now that normalization is customized in this case to to what Liberty Mutual wants. You know you don't you know you can come up as many as different ways of standardizing the data as you want. Um, but you know, in this case, what we've done is we've basically structured that normal, normalized that data to to a, a format which matches the, the 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 list that Todd was showing you earlier. So if we can go to the next slide, please. And and the focus of this had the focus of the F, the effort was really looking at the data that was in the financial statements, and that was in the statement of financial position, the statement of cash flows, and the statement of income. So we're basically pulling that information from these statements, and then we're basically normalizing that. Now there's a lot of extra detail in there that we that we kind of wanted to group up, and that's kind of what we did as part of this process. And we did it primarily for commercial and industrial companies. Now the there is other data in the financials you can see in the notes there's there's disclosures and there's um there's other information and document information in the taxonomy so we basically primarily pull from the financial statements however in some cases there is information you may want to pull from the disclosures which is more detailed um things about finance and operating leases we were able to pull from there from those disclosure notes as well so primarily we focused on what was in that that red box but if there was other additional information that we needed then we could pull it in from other parts of the other parts of the filing we go to the next slide, please, Michelle. Okay, so what this chart shows is just really showing the what's in the US GAAP taxonomy. And, and I'm showing you this so you can just, for those who aren't familiar with it, what the level of detail that's on there. So the, the taxonomy defines every single possible thing that a company could you know, generally report within reason, not covers a, a, a good section of which public companies are typically going to report and in there on the left it's just giving you a breakdown for example here of the um of the cash flow statement um, and then showing you from the proceeds proceeds from sale of property plant and equipment um, in addition the taxonomy includes a, a calculation which is on the right which says you know this item could be made up of any of these these six items or seven items that are shown here. So this is this is all the potential things that a company could report to represent their proceeds from sale of property, plant, and equipment. And a company could report any or many or multiples of, of those items on the right. Can you go to the next slide, please? And so, so a company might, company one might report their proceeds from sale of property held for sale, another one might report proceeds from sale of buildings, or another one might report proceeds from sale of water systems. But from a normalization perspective, we may only care about, hey, we only care about what was the property, plant, and equipment that they sold. So when we go and pull the data um, and we normalize it, we basically take all these and we, we put them all together and we get one total for what, what we you know what were the proceeds what was the cash they received from selling pp and e so that that's kind of the the process we want to replicate we want to take we don't necessarily care about the detail we want to roll it up to a point where we can do an apples to apples comparison so if you go to the next slide please michelle and here's an example company one may have report property held for sale company two may have reported four items you can see there buildings machinery equipment furniture and company three may have reported two but at the end of the day um you know we what we want to compare is we want to see that there's you know, sales from pp and e of 100 four, 10, and 50 so we want to compare all of those so the way that this normalization process works is we we're able then to say let's say for a given line item what do we what do we do how do we analyze this XRL filing to get that so if you go to the so we're going to look here at commercial just to take an example let's say for commercial sales this is the the term that's defined by liberty commercial sales they want to know what's the total total sales that we have 
um, and how do we calculate that? So if we go to the next slide. So the way that the mapping process works, um, and so if anyone, if you're going to undertake to do this, if you want to pull the data from, from SEC filings, this is kind of the logic that we've applied, and it seems to work pretty well in, in you know, 90, 95% of cases. So, um, so if we've got commercial sales, for example, we want to know what are, what are all the possible types of elements in the US GAAP taxonomy that you can have commercial sales. So you can see there's a circle on the left which is basically just a set this is and that list contains a list of all the commercial sales in the us gap taxonomy so we basically identify those and you can identify those by the calculation and we'll talk about that in a minute how you can identify those that set very easily and then on the right hand side we have a, a set of all the items that the company reports in their income statement that are that are in what I call leaf items. So this is this is items that are not subtotals. We don't want to include subtotals because um, because we know that uh, we don't want to end up double counting anything. So we only count those items that are that are leaf items in the income statement. And then we just take the intersection of those two sets, and that will give us a list of all the items that are sales. And then we can then we can add those up and get the the sum of sales. And then we repeat this process for every every line item that we want to get: cost of goods sold, SGNA, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then that way we can we can basically get a, a nice custom set. We don't have to map every single item of US GAAP elements into our into our into our our normalized data set otherwise it's going to be too long to do and it's too time consuming and it's a maintenance nightmare so this is the way we do it so it just makes it super efficient we go to the next slide please so the set of all possible values we come up with this so if you look at the us gap taxonomy we'll say okay these are all the revenue items that are in the taxonomy and then we say go and look at the calculation and give us all the things that comprise revenues so that 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 circle on in the on the left-hand side of the blue circle would be comprised of all of these elements. It would include, you know, from the very top, revenue from contract with customers, revenue not from contract with customers, direct finance lease revenue, operating lease revenue, sale of trust um, to assets, what, whatever it is, it's going to basically include all of these items are going to get dumped in that set. And then if they've reported any of these items in the income statement, we'll pull those up and they'll put those into our standardized account. So th this is kind of just, you know, very, you know how that process works. Um, so if you go to the next slide, Michelle, you'll see then we can we can output that value um, to into a you know this is a rudimentary income statement. So we can see these are the revenues for this particular company. We add all those things up. Now that commercial sales there may be made up of ten items they reported um, on their income statement, um, but then we can just get that into an apples apples comparison. So if we go to the next slide, please. So the other aspect of this is, and people have talked about this a lot, is sometimes you get companies create their own extent, what they call an extension element. So we're taking all those elements from the US GAAP taxonomy. Um, and then what we do with those is we basically, we basically look at their filing and then we see uh, any of these items comprise of comprised of what's an extension element. And you can see there in this example, this is Amazon. Um, you can see there's AMZN and we've included this in SGNA. This is their fulfillment expense, for example. The first thing we do is we look at the income statement. We say, are there any extension items on the income statement? Then we can see what they roll into. So if they're rolling into, let's say, um, operating expenses, then we could put it into other operating expense. One of the things that we did with this exercise is we went through and we looked at where are the extension elements that they've created. Um, and for major items, we identified those. And we, in, in this case, we, we looked at them. Um, they'd normally default to dropping into another account. But if they were material, then we would map them to a base element. So from the case of Amazon fulfillment expense, we basically said, OK, let's we want to move this rather than putting in another operating expense, we're going to move it into SGNA. So when you get the results, you we set up like a little chart for that. Uh, and it actually didn't take very long. I thought it would have taken longer, but it was relatively quick because um, we can just look at these are the extension items. We're not sure where we want to put them. Um, and then we would just map them into a base account. And you can see here like Amazon content expense, we map, map that into R&D. And you can see at the very bottom, there's a commercial other operating expense. So if we don't map, an operating expense 
um, into a, a specific line item, it's going to drop into the other. And so this is up to the analyst. The analyst can say, hey, I've got these extension elements in there. I'm just going to move them into this account. And then they do that once. And then um, every time that company files subsequently to that, it'll get automatically mapped into that, that mainline normalized account that we've set up. Let's go to the next slide, please. And this works because generally companies will, con will um, continue to use the same extension element from period to period. Um, so once you've done that process once, then it's kind of it's going to kind of work seamlessly from then from then on. Okay, go to the next slide, please. So how do we do this? Some of the tools we used, we we basically used what we did for this was used uh, the Zool open source processing language. This is a, a language that we developed and we kind of, we had developed this initially to, to basically write business rules. Um, and this is openly available. So if you want to use it, you can use that. Um, and basically the reason we use it because it has a number of functions that can automate the process and make it easily easier to do. Um, and it handles things like periods and dimensions automatically. So that, that means you don't have to worry about um, writing complex code to handle, oh, okay, let me go through every period and do it. It kind of does that. And then it outputs that information just in a consumable JSON file. So we can output a JSON file, which basically says, you know, here's my standard element. This is the value for it. And these were the elements from the, from the XBRL filing, which basically comprise that total. Um, so we get the next slide. I think that's, I think that's basically all we're going to cover. Um, so then I'll hand it back to Michelle and then we can go through what this looks like afterwards. Great, thanks Campbell. So that's the process that, um, that Liberty Mutual and Xreal US went through to develop this, this mapping. And we're gonna turn now back to Todd Shantz who's gonna tell us a little bit about uh, how the process works today. Yeah, and so in preparation of kind of utilizing the XBRL process, we, we took advantage of the opportunity to improve um, our worksheet. We wanted to expand the list of cells so that the data were to populate. We'd have a little bit more uh, options there for us. And um, that's, that's actually working out quite well. So kind of a precursor to kind of how we're, we're treating the financial analysis going, going forward. Uh, next slide. So, you know, similar to earlier, we're still um, inputting um, some of the information we, we seek to uh, analyze, um, you know, the statement date, um, currency, what have you. But what we have added at the very top uh, is this tab that we'll click, and that's going to kind of start the download process, if you will. And by selecting that, the underwriter now has the ability to select what set of financials he or she wants to review. Um, this goes back a few years. You can grab the K's or the Q's. And so in, in our example here, we're going we're gonna to click on a, a 10K. So next slide, please. And so that, that populates. Now, the really neat thing about this is it's a hyperlink and it's highlighted here. And if the underwriter would click that link, it would take him directly to the K in this case, or the Q. And so from here, the underwriter can go and depending on you know one style, you might want to go directly to the financial statements, kind of look at those. Some might go to the, the notes, kind of look at that, or maybe even the recap, um, kind of, you know, review what went on during the year before the actual um, analysis, you know, takes place. Next screen. So here I'm kind of showing, um, it's a little busy, but we, the purpose here is just to, kind of show you how we've expanded the income statements. And if you'll notice, um, kind of in the notes section where we would, you know, prior to we're having to manually kind of explain, you know, the source of the numbers or how the number um, came to be, how many different components to that number. Um, the XBRL, 
pre-populated these hyperlinks. So for any one um, cell that has a hyperlink similar to the K, I'll click on that link and it'll take the underwriter to that specific section within the financial statement that kind of explains that number. And if there are multiple hyperlinks, then that's an indication that uh, there's a couple of different components uh, for that cell. So here I just um, kind of illustrating what we were uh, kind of manually inputting and uh, what, what it looks like after. And I've just selected uh, kind of the operating expenses to the income statement. Um, we've, we've basically uh, enhanced just about every component within the financial statements. And um, that, that's really been a benefit for us. Still doesn't mean you're gonna have you know, other items, um, but the more cells you have in your statements, then it's a little bit easier on the eyes and the underwriter can explain some of the, the primary components. Next slide, please. We still maintained um, the ability of the uh, underwriter to go in and allow or disallow any asset. Um, but again, highlighting the hyperlink in the balance sheet to that section in the financials. Um, very efficient. And, you know, sometimes the amount of time the underwriter would spend to manually input the financial information, uh, anywhere from, you know, 20 minutes to an hour. Uh, and, and, you know, each underwriter is different and they might explore the notes. So, you know, the hour could turn into two hours, but with the XBRL product, we're gaining so much efficiencies with the download and mapping it into the worksheets we created. Um, it's just been, it's been a positive, big positive for the underwriting team. Next screen, please. I just wanted to kind of illustrate the cash flow statement um, because there's a lot of data that goes into this statement and you'll notice some of the hyperlinks um, to the right. I've highlighted those and I think um, it was explained that, you know, sales, um, that's a big item. And here you have, you know, multiple hyperlinks to kind of explain the gross number. So again, just another, another great advantage of the XBRL product. Um, if you want to find out something, you're not thumbing through the notes, boom, you hit the hyperlink and it takes you directly uh, to that specific area in the financial statement. And I believe that's it. Todd, thanks very much. I think now we're going to turn it back over to uh, Greg Davenport. And um, Greg is going to talk a little bit about um, how they feel uh, Liberty Mutual Surety has benefited from the program. Thanks, Michelle. The, um, the benefits I want to talk about, they really fall into a few categories that I even touched on in the um, intro. Uh, with regards to data, for example, you saw the level of detail that we can now have in our financial analysis system. So even if the detail was provided in the source document, the financial statement itself, as underwriters, when we're manually keying that in, there's a tendency to want to group things. So Todd showed you the example of operating expenses. In the before picture, that was uh, uh, combined. But in the uh, with the new XBR download, we can bring in all that detail and have that available at the click of a button to the uh, everyone involved in the underwriting chain when uh, needed. And the data is more accurate. I mean, just human nature, there would be transpositions of data uh, when you're rekeying something from a PDF or a... Uh, paper financial statement. The other category is really about underwriting, which is truly the key benefit of this. Um, by staying current with financial analysis, those of you on the call that are from the surety industry uh, know that uh, that can, of course, help mitigate losses. 
uh, we'll have a faster response time to our agents, brokers, and our customers because we have the data uh, quicker. We don't have to wait for financials to come, or maybe they've been submitted, but uh, it's sitting in a backlog on somebody's desk to enter. Uh, as you saw, in seconds, we'll have that data. And as I mentioned earlier, in, you know, depending on how the surety looks at it, if they're good financial results, that can lead to increased capacity when justified, which can lead to increased premium for uh, the sureties and increased commission for the brokers um, and more work um, or opportunities for the clients. And then from a, I guess, satisfaction standpoint, this allows underwriters to be freed up to, to grow the business or develop existing relationships. That's really the fun of the business anyway. And where the value, that's what we're paying the underwriters for is that aspect, not to key data. And uh, as I mentioned before, hopefully that results in an increased job satisfaction and retention. Um, uh, we're all on the surety side uh, looking for good people uh, and we hope to keep them a long time. So we think this will help us in that respect. And then uh, finally, from a return on investments standpoint, which again, it starts with a business case, convincing somebody that this is a worthwhile endeavor, uh, I'm thrilled to report that our return on investment, we expect to be 150% in the first year and 650% over five years. The um, amount of effort, I won't get into the detail on the exact hours, but relative to most uh, system projects, it's uh, very, very modest. Uh, there was probably as much time spent, Todd, Angie, Campbell working together to map the data as it took to develop this. Next slide, please. And then on the future, um, I mean, we have, this is just a start. We have a lot of things we've been talking about. They aren't in necessarily in this order, but uh, one thing that we can do even with the SEC data is uh, map to be more industry specific, uh, particularly for financial services. We um, want to extend this outside of the US in uh, some countries, not only public companies, but even private companies are required to report in XBRL format. Again, XBRL is a global standard. And uh, so we can leverage the investment we've already made to bring that data in as well over time. Another thing we've talked about is uh, today, as Todd showed you, it's a manual process to click the button. Um, when you're ready to do your analysis as an underwriter, but there's ability that we could have uh, the system automatically detect when a company files a 10K or 10Q and have that downloaded into our financial system automatically. So we're always current on the data and we can mine the SEC data for even business that isn't ours. Uh, so we have that for benchmarking. And then finally, as I mentioned uh, in the first part, we definitely want to extend this to contractor financial statements, including work in process schedules, as that data becomes available in XBRL format. And again, that's going to take some time, but the right parties are at the table and a lot of those discussions are taking place. So we're very excited about that because construction is um, over half of, our, half of our business. So again, this is just a start, lots of opportunities, uh, thanks to XBRL. And, and XBRL US, who's really helped uh, facilitate us getting this far. Greg, thanks very much. We're gonna move on to a Q and A. So I'm gonna ask all of our speakers to uh, put their videos back on. And um, we have with us today again, Greg Davenport, Senior VP Global Risks at Liberty Mutual Surety, uh, Campbell Pry, President and CEO of XBRL US, and Angela Starkey and Todd Shantz, who are both uh, commercial surety managers at Liberty Mutual Surety. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for, for joining us. Uh, we do have some, some questions that have come in, and I also just want to remind people that if you have questions, just click on the little Q&A link that you see on your console and key in your question there. Um, so the first question that I have is, um, let's see. Um, this one's a, I'm not sure, I'll, I'll handle, handle this one over to Greg. How are surety customers adopting or adapting to this? How do you see customers ultimately leveraging this? Well, the, the customers that uh, file with SEC, they 
they don't even know about this. They don't need to know. Uh, but hopefully uh, what they'll see is improved responsiveness, even faster responsiveness. I mean, we pride ourselves on our responsiveness at Liberty Mutual Surety, but uh, hopefully that'll just continue to get even better. Uh, and again, that might lead to, to capacity and, and, and those type of things too. So uh, it's nice to tell the story so they know what's happening behind the scenes, but it's, uh, it, it doesn't affect them from any additional work or anything, doing, anything differently than what they do today in terms of providing financial information to us. Okay, great. Um, and then a question is, um, on average, about how many data fields or data points do sureties process in their credit scoring models? How many data points do you have to collect for, say, for a single company? I would estimate it's around 100 fields, and then those fields feed into various financial ratios and then a trend summary as well. Okay, great. Thanks, Angie. And has that, has the number, and I think Todd was talking about the fact that the number of data fields has increased now with the XBL program. And would you say that's increased by 50%, by 10% in terms of how many data? you're able to bring in to analyze? Probably 20%. We could have added more too, but want to keep it pretty readable as well. Okay. <laughs> big, big screens. Yeah. 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 <laughs> There's a lot of data behind that, those numbers. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, and then I have a couple questions for Campbell. Um, how do you make sure to capture the new leaf or new tag names in your groupings? And Campbell, you're on mute right now, just in case. Okay. Yeah, I'm talking to myself. Okay, so on that, so there's a couple of things in here. The, fir the first item is, you know, how to keep the mappings up to date in the, uh, just on that, there are, can be new elements added for accounting changes in US GAAP. The way that, that we, we handle that is we kind of, and you know, I showed in the presentation there is if we've got revenues, we basically take all the all the descendants of revenues that are included in the US GAAP taxonomy. So if there's new reporting requirements, they they will automatically get picked up um, if they're if they're included in a, in, a, in a particular total that we're pulling from the US GAAP taxonomy. And then for the leaf items, um, we identify those from the calculation that's provided. The companies, when they report an XBRL, they provide a calculation. And so then you can look, go through and you look at the income statement and you can look at all those items that are not a subtotal and you can determine those by the, the ones that don't have something adding into them. So that's how, that's how we determine those. Um, and then then how do we know which ones they're added? Um, we don't kind of, we don't, we basically look at each filing that's actually filed and what they've reported. So we don't have a, you know, we don't maintain a list of what they've reported in the past. We just go and look at the filing and what they've reported and pull all those, pull all those items out. Um, from time to time, they may add a new extension in there. So if they do add a new extension in their filing, um, that's going to drop into kind of an other, like, for example, if it was a current asset and it was an extension that, made, that was included in current assets, we'd put that in other current assets. Um, and then the analyst would need to look at that and say, okay, I'm going to move that into a, another category if I think that's relevant. So that, that's kind of how we, that's how we handle um, the leaf items and keeping those groupings up to date. Thank you. Um, the next question um, also for Campbell, although it could be, could be really for um, you know, Angie or Todd as well. How do you handle possible signage errors in the statement submitted, especially like in the statement of cash flow? So, so I can answer that. Um, so the cash, one of the, we have um, another process that we have that Expert US runs for filers so that they can actually check their filings before they file them with the SEC. And one of the checks we have is to check for signage errors on the um, on the cash flow statement. So if you try and file to the SEC, you're going to flag a whole bunch of errors. So we what we've tried to do is put a number of rules in so we don't have those problems on the tail end. Um, in this, in the, in the actual, in this system that we have, so we basically go through, and then we'll take that data. We'll basically assume that it's correct, but we have some checksums in there. So if the checksum doesn't come out um, on the cash flow for you know the financing, the operating, and the investing, it's going to give a, a flag on that, and then the analyst may have to go in and flip it if it's a, a valid 
data error. But and it does ha that can happen if, if people ignore the errors in their filing and file them. Um, but on the back end, we have we're doing a lot to make sure that we don't those errors don't actually get filed with the SEC in the first place. Okay, great. And here's a question um, that I think is more uh, for Angie and Todd um, is what kind of program do you use after extracting the expiral data? And I think here, you know, I don't think you need to get into, you know, the technical explanation of the system that you have, but I think maybe a little bit of, a, uh, you know, something about Workbench, about the Workbench system that you have. So the Workbench system kind of houses our financial analysis as long as information on the account overall. So that's where the data is feeding in. And then, as I mentioned, we have kind of a trend summary that also is captured on those accounts. Great, thank you. Um, and then the next question, um, SEC and you know, Edgar filing reports are required for public companies. Uh, which number about you know four thousand plus or five thousand? What about underwriting for private companies that are not required to file with the SEC? And I think I think Greg, this this may be a good one for you. <laughs> this is this is what the this is the golden uh, the uh, the source that we're all looking for is the private companies. Right. So so I, I touched on that in the um, next steps and and even even the benefits. But as you mentioned, Michelle. Um, most of our business is construction. Uh, we, again, worked as an industry with XBRL to expand the taxonomy to account for percentage of a co completion accounting for work and process schedules. One of the very early proof of concepts, give a nod to Hart the Hartford, um, uh, did the work and process schedule to prove that. And uh, I distinctly remember it was a very minimal uh, development effort to boot, but the challenge is how do you get the data in XBRL format? There are um, some uh, entities that offer translation programs um, and can even take a PDF and, and scan it and put it into uh, XBRL format. So that is available to deal with the private companies. But what we're really after is to convince CPAs, and financial system providers for contractors to provide their output digitally, not just um, not just a PDF in XBRL format, so then we can consume it. Again, we're, we we really don't want to put that uh, onto our client customers, whether they be contractors or publicly traded companies. They should do what they do, but it's the uh, solution providers. They kind of were in the middle uh, that we're really uh, trying to convince to provide the XBRL data. And Campbell, I don't know if you might want to expand on private companies outside the U.S. Um, because they, as I understand it, they there are some that are required uh, by the regulators to provide XBRL uh, reporting. Yeah, so on that um, outside of the US, many private companies have to report um, their the financial statements um, to a to to a custom house or a or a, a registration authority for companies. So in the UK, for example, all private companies have to report their financial statements in an XBRL format to the customs house. So I think that's about three million filings a year are made in XBRL file in format in the in XBRL there. South Africa does the same thing. Um, I think Australia is looking at doing it as well. Um, so there are, and they do the same in India as well. So there's a, no, there's a number of initiatives globally to do that. And then obviously public company data as well in other jurisdictions is also an XBRL, for example, Japan, Taiwan, um, the European Union or companies are going to have to, public companies are going to have to report an XBRL as well. So there's a number of efforts going on globally to basically report this data in an XBRL format. So it's just going to get more and more. And then, then I think for private companies in the US, um, there have been requests by a number of parties to get data in an XBRL format as well. So it's kind of like, um, if we can get that data in a structured format or in a standardized format, it makes sense because then it can be used not only by obviously the surety industry, but by many, many others, including banks and um, investors. Another question that kind of builds on this is um, just on who else is using this. And I think this one's for Greg. Who are the most difficult to convince 
the CPA firms or the software providers? <laughs> or both. I'll punt on that, punt on that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I mean, when you see pay firms, I mean, there are tens of thousands of them. Uh, so, you know, that that's hard to answer. But but I think where there are large CPA firms or in particular the larger solution providers that provide financial uh, systems uh, such as Timberline, I believe is one and others, um, they, they're, they're at the table, as I mentioned. And I think that if we can uh, convince them and you know, contractors, agents, brokers, other parties can convince them, then uh, by them adopting it, they'll get the ball the, the ball rolling. Great, thank you. Um, and Campbell, another technical question. How do you handle sign changes on income statement for other income expense? Is it the same method as for the cash flow statement? Yeah, sometimes, and I think I, I think what this question is asking, sometimes you'll get a line item that's like other income expense and in one year it's positive and one year it's negative. So we take that into account. We actually normalize that. So if it's a negative expense, we'll put it into income. And if it's a, if it's a negative income, we'll put it into expense. So we, we actually do look at the values, particularly for those items where they've kind of like a netting situation. And the same kind of thing happens also for interest income expense. Sometimes you see that as well if they don't report the you know the gross net income if they if they net it against something else so when we do the normalization we have a look at that and some of these elements where we know that they're the netting elements and then we basically we basically extract from those we'll put them into the appropriate place depending if they're positive or negative i think that's what the questions ask are asking but generally, in terms of quality of the data, if someone puts the sign in wrong, that used to be a problem a few years ago with XPIRL, but um, there's been a lot of um, rules have been added to, to tidy that up. So we, don't re we didn't really see that many issues with items being tagged with the incorrect sign on them. Okay, and Campbell, another question. Have you published educational material on how to set up Zool and use it, like for finding the leaf nodes and node hierarchy in a particular report? We, we actually, up on our website, we have a number of materials uh, for Zool. We have um, detailed documentation about how you can write the rules. And we have lots of examples about how you can write the rules. Um, we're also currently at the moment just developing a training program, um, which we're nearly finished. So then you, if you want to go through that, then you can, you can do that as well. And that kind of shows you how, that kind of shows you how you write these, these expressions so you can pull this data out. Great, and I think we just, I just see one more question, but uh, you know, feel free to submit any additional questions here. Um, what are the possibilities for XBRL to collaborate with the American Association of Insurance Services, AAIS, which is introducing open IDL with the Linux Foundation to automate and harmonize the reporting of other types of data reports requested by insurance regulators regarding casualty and property risk? I know, Campbell, if that's something you wanna take care of. Are you, I'm not that familiar with that with that standard that they're doing. I can certainly go and have a look at it. And yeah, if there's anything we can do to to improve the, the quality of the reporting, we would be interested in participating in that. Yeah, we're always happy to partner with other organizations because you know XPRL is um, it's a it's a data standard. It's kind of the conduit. Like you harmonize it with US GAAP, you harmonize it with other other data standards um, or other accounting standards. Um, and so partnering with an organization would be a, a great approach. So give me a call if you have uh, partnering ideas. Michelle, on that, on that point, um, if I might, I'd like to uh, mm -hmm. really give a shout out to uh, the NASBP, the National Association mm -hmm. of Bond Producers, and the SFAA, the Surety and Fidelity Association of America, who have been very uh, involved, very supportive, in not only expanding the x standard, but uh, promoting it. And uh, uh, they've just been great champions of this. So uh, those are two associations that really appreciate uh, their support. And uh, another opportunity I'll mention, um, I don't know we won't get into in detail, but uh, there's also been work uh, with the SBA, the Small Business Administration in the United States. Mm -hmm. The focus primarily has been on more the application side, but uh, 
again, this was for me, but if, if SBA at some point said we want financial statements submitted in XPRL format, that would be another driver of uh, trying to move this along for private uh, companies. Absolutely. We've started working with the SBA on uh, getting work in process data um, submitted to them and, and accepted by them in, in XPRL format. And um, we're, so we're working closely with their surety guarantee group on that. So, yeah, thank you to the SBA as well, because they've uh, they've been good partners on that. And, um, and you know, and I also want to thank the XPRL US Working Group um, for surety, who, which has been you know, really focused on this for a long time. And uh, Greg and Liberty Mutual were really one of the uh, the founders of that group. So thank you to them. Um, and I think those are all the questions that we have. One question is, you know, would actually was conduct a Zoom tutorial to teach members to use Zool. And yes, we, we have been doing um, periodic webinars that uh, walk through uh, what Zool can do and how to use it for different types of applications. We did one a few months ago and you can look at the replay for that, um, but we will have more coming up. And as, as uh, Campbell said, we're also working on a training program on how to use Zool for your own purposes. So uh, please, uh, Check in with us, contact us if you want to hear more about this. And, um, you know, if you're on our, our email list, we'll be sure to let you know if, if there are more things coming on. Um, the other thing I want to mention, and we will send this out as a link when we uh, follow up with everybody about the replay, because as I said, we are recording this. Um, we did put together a case study with Liberty. Liberty actually you know, drafted that case study and it walks through this example in, in even more detail. So um, thanks very much to the whole Liberty team here. And, um, you know, for all your work, working with us to get this done. And, um, you know, we're very excited about it. And we'll, we'll have more Zool focused and processing language focused webinars going forward. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.